Hello, everyone. Welcome to the RFAMD podcast. I'm your host, Philip James. And today we have a great guest from Tulane University, Dr. Imad Kandil. Dr. Kandil, welcome. Thank you for having me, Philip. Well, it's great to have you here. And for those listening or watching, just to only do real quick background, endocrine surgeon, performed thousands of thyroid surgeries, but you've also are leading the way, pioneering thyroid ablation in the United States with almost a thousand thyroid ablation. So whenever having an interview and a guest, and we're talking about this interview topic is say no to thyroid surgery. And then people find out that there's a thyroid surgeon as a guest. It makes the episode even more fascinating. So on that note, I'm going to ask you a question. How did you end up choosing what you do? I mean, did you know you wanted to be a surgeon since you were a little, little boy or Walk us through that. So, so it's a very good question. I actually like to tell the story. So I uh, actually loved math. I was not interested in uh, in biology because you need to memorize a lot, but I was more into math and uh, just critical thinking. Um, and at the time of the application back home when, in Egypt, like uh, you apply for either medicine or engineering, but I was going for engineering for sure. At that time, uh, my youngest brother uh, went into seizure and I thought he he's dead. So I took him my hand, I ran with him to another building where there's a doctor there and he somehow gave him an injection and then he came back and I'm like, oh my God, he saved my brother life. I need to be a doctor. Just one event really switched my, my decision all my life from wow. what engineering and math to be a doctor. After I learned things in medicine about epilepsy and all this, I learned that this injection means nothing. He was just going to come back anyway. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it was really a life-changing uh, story for me. Yeah. So I uh, I loved it. I thought uh, I I want to help people. I, uh, I want to make uh, an impact in, uh, in people's lives. So that was great. And making an impact, you are. How old were you when that happened? Um, I was uh, 18, 18 years old. Yeah. The magic of the magic of medicine is okay. perceived back then. I need to go yeah. to medical school. Yeah. <laughs> well, with that being said, there's a lot of innovation in technology that are advancing the treatment of thyroid disease, and we're talking about ablation. What thyroid diseases? can be treated with ablation? That's a very good question. So um, uh, the way I actually like the question to be, what cannot be treated by thyroid ablation? Um, the reason for this that now the indication keep expanding and expanding and expanding, and there are only actually limited scenarios where we can just provide uh, ablation is not an option or um, minimally invasive intervention or non-operative interventions are not an option. Um, you know, you. so going back to my story, where, why I went to medicine and I wanted to make an impact in people's life, this is why also I like surgery because you can quickly make an impact in people's life. Uh, you take someone sick with a tumor, you take it out, they have no tumor, just a quick impact. So I love surgery for that reason. Um, but then the ablation is a quick impact, uh, but very minimally invasive. So you, it's really very impactful procedure in people's life. Uh, what we do with surgery, even if we think we are excellent and we try to quote risk of complication 1% or less, and good surgeons can have really less than 1% complications and near 0% complications. Having said that, if you really do surveys for patients following an operation, there are significant problems that patients deal with. When we say no complications, this means that we did not cut a nerve, we did not er injure an organ, uh, no infection, no bleeding, things are good, but there are more than that. So one out of five patients after um, removing the entire gland will never feel normal again. If you do, if you look at the studies that did surveys for patients following thyroid surgery, maybe up to 50% will have issues with swallowing and neck discomfort and change in voice, etc. Uh, difficulty exercising and all that, despite that we document that there are no complications. So 
to go back to the question about what are the indications? Well, we started only treating patients with benign disease, uh, benign large nodules, uh, and then the size was an issue, then we kept doing better, so the size keep going larger. And then we moved to hyperfunctioning nodules, nodules that secrete excessive thyroid hormones, so we can avoid surgery or radioiodine, but by basically doing the ablation. And then we moved to cancer, and we only started treating small cancers. And now studies showed that we can treat larger and larger cancers. And then we move to metastatic cancer when you have a thyroid out and you have metastatic lymph node, and you can actually ablate that and bring the marker for cancer almost near to zero or to zero with the ablation. Uh, so there is significantly um, uh, increase in the number of the indications. So what cannot be treated by uh, um, ablation? Well, in my mind, a disease like Graves' disease, because so glands can be large, can be hyperactive, so ablation here is not going to have a rule. However, we can treat this actually by uh, an embolization, for example, and I've been, uh, my team does this uh, uh, treatment option. We offer this to our patients. The success rate is not 100%, but uh, the reported success rate at least um, um, 70 to 80% which is very good uh, to start with. Um, so advanced cancer, if you have a very large cancer or metastatic cancer, ideally these should be treated by an operation. Um, but the good news is most cancers are small cancers. 80% of papyrothyroid cancers are very early stage and not advanced, not metastatic. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Dr. Kendall, treating thyroid disease with ablation, we keep hearing stories that are, you know, four years ago would have been a little bit surprising or shocking to know that we're seeing cases that are being treated like this. Then two or three cases that kind of surprised you, either that you treated or you heard about other doctors treating around the world uh, with thyroid ablation. Well, um, like mention specific scenarios. Yeah, just uh, something that you would think, wow, you know, you heard of either another doctor treat a very well, dynamic you know, case or I, you did. I did travel to both uh, Italy and to uh, Korea to learn about this and see it live and train for it. And um, I, I, I had like a significant interest in this topic for over a decade ago. I did submit grants to the NIH with ablation of thyroid cancer using really the high flow, the high intensity flow ultrasound. I had the machine, I was working on this and animal models. So I have a significant belief that this work. This technology has been out there for over two decades in treating liver cancer and kidney cancer, et cetera. And HIFO has been out there over a decade in Europe. Um, and RFA has been out over a decade outside the US. It, we, we really take things very slowly in US, making sure it's carefully done and everything, which is great but it's only got recently approved by the FDA. But I was waiting for this FDA approval. Once it got approved, I was one of the, like, the first people in the US to start. Uh, so um, talking about scenarios, I personally can tell you a few scenarios, and it's just really impressive. One of my best stories that I mentioned, 80-something-year-old gentleman, significant medical problems, um, hyperactive nodule, not, uh, not managed medically, did not respond to radioiodine, and... He, he is not a candidate for surgical intervention. So his doctor heard about this approach. He sent him to me from Florida, and it took literally a few minutes to ablate that nodule, and all of a sudden, this gentleman is cured. This 80-something-year-old gentleman was jumping in the hallway, can't believe that how great he feels, and he's just done with this disease. It's just fascinating. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Other stories, small cancer is gone. The cancer can disappear. If small cancer, you burn it well, you burn the nodule very well, you burn around very well, it can literally disappear. And if there is remnant tissue, the biopsy will show no cancer. And I actually try, as most of my patients come out of town and they have biopsy done by the same doctors and more, many of these come from really great institutions like Ohio State, University of Florida, et cetera. And the biopsy will show no cancer. Uh, repeat biopsy will show no cancer. So it's just fascinating. Awesome. Um, for this interview, uh, the topic, say no to thyroid surgery. Now you're a thyroid surgeon, but in the context of this interview, 
say no to thyroid surgery? What does that mean to you? Well, uh, I, I mean, I had a passion for minimal invasive intervention. And I think as a surgeon, uh, we are very well trained and uh, very well experienced with the anatomy, with the anatomical landmarks of this area. Where the nerve runs, we always learn how to protect that nerve. We know a lot of these details. So we still offer this option to our patients. So not performing a surgery does not mean that we are out of business. We, we're still going to help patients. And we, we are, I think we are very well trained to, to do that. So we know where the nerve enters, etc. We know how to protect that nerve. We know how to stay safe. So this is something that we, we are trained to do. So um, I feel it just, I, I, when I see a patient that was already planning to do surgery and we are able to avoid that, it's just a very impactful thing in their life and it's just very satisfying for what I do. Dr. Kindel, uh, here we go. Uh, active surveillance. Active surveillance, for those listening or watching, that's where they know uh, they have cancer, but uh, instead of treating it with surgery or ablation, it's observed. But where does this road intersect between thyroid ablation and active surveillance? So I have a significant interest in active surveillance and I spend years of my life writing grants and topics about this. The problem with active surveillance is that most patients do very well for, for the rest of their life. Only like maybe three to 4% can progress. And until now, we have no idea which one will progress, which one not. So I feel these patients for active surveillance will benefit from the ablation because when you do the ablation, you have a control of the scenario and at least you, you prevent the risk of progression. Fantastic. Um, anesthesia. What, what is the preparation like when a, a patient comes in for thyroid ablation? What type of anesthesia is used and why? I would say over 95% can do very well with local anesthesia. Having said that, there are some patients that are very anxious and maybe to have, if they have a very large nodule or something like this, I might take a little longer and they want to have some sedation. I think doing a little sedation is good. I, I I've done hundreds of these with sedation and patients do very well. I do not need to talk to patients. What I need to do is to protect the nerve. That's what you need to do. So many patients really have great experience with some sedation. So I think we need to learn to listen to patients, see what they need, and then provide what they need. We get contacted a lot by patients saying, I read ablation, we never heard of it, in particular in North America, but around the world. What are the trends in regard to thyroid ablation in the United States, and why have some patients never heard of it? Unfortunately, many uh, facilities or many physicians are not trained to, to offer the procedure, so they do not mention it to patients. And many of these patients that seek the treatment uh, at our institution, for example, they just learn from a Facebook group or from the Internet. So we are very early in, um, in the stage of education. It takes a while for, for physicians to adopt and for people to be aware of their options. But I think uh, patients deserve to know all their options and make a decision accordingly. Yeah. Um, you said the word training. Um, is there a concern? You know, it seems like every which way you look right now, left and right, right, there's a thyroid ablation training being offered. Are there any concerns with this rapid growth of this uh, uh, procedure? I have significant concerns, significant concerns. I published a paper uh, a decade ago on robotic thyroid surgery. Robotic thyroid surgery is a great option. I have a huge passion for this. And, but what we published that all of a sudden there was a significant surge. We had like over 100 surgeons coming to watch and train, etc. But then significant complications happened across the country. And this is what I'm afraid of here. We already hear about significant disasters happening from RFA when you really can do this very safely. The problem is... People who are not qualified can offer it, and then serious disaster could happen. Tracheal, esophageal perforation, abscess formation. There are death reports. It's just uh, serious complications could happen, and I think a good uh, provider who is very well trained can avoid these complications. 
Well, that's pretty extreme. You said one of the complications could be death. It's probably pretty rare. But with that being said, for those listening or watching, they're probably saying, I'm interested in thyroid ablation. I want to avoid surgery. How should a patient select a doctor? I think like as if you select, this is a, let me repeat the answer again. So I think this is an excellent question. So the same way you select your doctor to treat your disease or your surgeon to perform your operation, it should be the same here. You look at his experience, how many he has done, uh, reviews, what other patients say about their experience, and then you make a decision. Is there any way a patient can find out how good a doctor is at performing thyroid ablation? You know, unfortunately, nowadays, there is no, for example, center of excellence like when we have for certain other diseases where you have a system. There is no one really uh, doing regulation or trying to make sure that someone is following the guidelines or good at this. Um, anyone can just offer it. So patients just uh, need to do their diligence looking at uh, the, the provider CV and expertise and reviews. And, and nowadays with the, the social media, people can really do that uh, very well. Facebook groups. And there's a number of ways I think a patient could be their own best advocate and try to locate the right doctor for this. Um, you mentioned the rapid growth of thyroid ablation, say, in the United States and really around the world right now. And you've been a real ambassador, uh, kind of a pioneer in, to offering training. Um, what are your thoughts on, say, thyroid disease training centers or as it relates to thyroid ablation? Well, we don't have like uh, right now uh, a specialized centers, but usually um, physicians can offer these through courses, through societies or with uh, maybe collaboration with some um, industrial support. Um, but definitely more physicians are interested in learning about this and they should so they can offer it to their patients. And uh, there is definitely significant increase of number of trained physicians across the country. With Dr. Kandab, I've watched a number of your interviews you've conducted over the past even years and months. But you, and I know you're an active guy, you know, you're, you're doing your hot yoga and you're out jogging, you know, on the weekends in the gym. But I've heard you say the word longevity. In the context of this interview, in the context of thyroid disease, uh, thyroid surgery, thyroid cancer, thyroid ablation, I know this might be a probably need a few minutes for this one, but what does longevity mean? This is an excellent question. So longevity does not mean just you live longer. It's about the quality of life. Uh, I want to be, when I am old, hopefully in my 80s or 90s, able to take care of myself, able to carry my own bag and just uh, travel independently and all this. So the bottom line is, if you are a patient, and I'm going to tell you that maybe this operation can make you live extra couple of years or so. If this is a more important to you or if you have a better quality of life. This operation can definitely affect the quality of life. As I mentioned before, one out of five after a total thyroidectomy will never feel normal again because even if you are taking your medication, even if your thyroid hormones are normal, you will never feel normal again. Nothing like your own hormones. The God makes it come out of your thyroid gland. Yeah, anything that can be done to save the thyroid to avoid surgery and still get the care needed, like using thyroid ablation, it is going to preserve quality of life. Absolutely. Sure. The quality of life is huge. Like the one of the big number one reason for people to die in an older age, like when they have an injury, when you get an injury, that's usually the end of the story. Uh, an injury in elder and in and uh, old age can maybe increase your risk uh, 10 times of death compared to uh, other people who did not have injury. But the bottom line is, if you, this is considered a huge, like, problem that will delay your progression and in order for you to go back to your condition and physical status and the way you used to be, it's going to be a while. So if you can avoid that intervention and just um, um, 
have a procedure that can keep your thyroid and prevent you from um, deterioration, I think that's very ideal. Mm -hmm. You know, you've kind of answered it, but I'm going to ask you. Um, you're an endocrine surgeon. You've performed thousands of thyroid surgeries. You don't have to offer thyroid ablation. So why do you? As I said, I think it's... Uh, I still perform surgery. I'm still enjoying doing surgery. But now it's, it's uh, very satisfying to me when I offer something that we can prevent an operation and we are making an impact on, on people's life. I, I always like think about this at the end of my career, what I want to be said about me. And I want to really make an impact on people's life. And I think that's huge. Um, and I think we are in... Um, at a certain time where this is going to be like the beginning of this era. Um, eventually, this will be the standard of care. We are struggling a little bit that the most insurance do not cover this, but eventually it will be covered. I'm not sure when, but it, uh, once that happens, th this uh, will be offered to most patients. We're going to continue to offer it in addition to surgery for other patients who are not candidates for the procedure. So on that note, in the United States, for a patient who doesn't have insurance that covers it, what does thyroid ablation call, cost in the United States? Uh, maybe you can kind of offer a range. It's really a very wide range. Um, um, I hear in some uh, places can be as low as uh, $4,000, $5,000, but in some other places it can go to $30,000. Um, so it depends on where you go and depends on different things. It depends if the procedure is done in the hospital or in an office, the facility fee, uh, the overhead and all the kind of things. So um, it's just uh, extremely variable. But um, we are working now with the uh, AMA to get a CPT code for this. It's already submitted. I'm not sure when this is going to happen. It's been... Um, almost four years since the FDA approval now, at, uh, at least three years, we're over three years with the FDA approval, and um, we still do not have a CPT code for uh, for the insurance company to use. Uh, Dr. Kendall, um, you said a range of 5000 to $30,000? To my knowledge, yeah. And that's in the United States? Yeah, outside the United States, it's a lot cheaper sometimes, but... I make me wonder if they actually use new probes for every single case, because in some places, the offer is almost the cost of the probe, which is kind of crazy. Does this does not include, obviously, the overhead of buying the machine, uh, the ultrasound, uh, mm -hmm. the facility, and over the, the overhead of the employees, etc. So you just wonder how they are making it that low. So I think patients should be careful when they make a decision about uh, trying to save money going somewhere else. Yeah. What is recovery like? Uh, me, most of my patients are actually come from out of town, and uh, many of these patients will literally just come and leave on the same day. They just uh, fly in the morning and fly right after the procedure. Uh, so that's an option. Uh, I live in New Orleans, so a lot of people like to enjoy New Orleans a little bit. So many of them, they will just stay overnight, uh, hang out. and But um, they after the procedure, they uh, they maybe ask him to, uh, to sit in the waiting area for like five minutes or so, and they're ready to go. Some of them you know, don't. We're talking to, yeah, why not? While you're in New Orleans, you might as well go out and have some good food and uh, check yeah. out some of the culture. Yeah, patients, though, but one important thing, patient can uh, develop a little bit of discomfort and swelling after specifically ablation of a large mass uh, that can last for a couple of days. Uh, we usually recommend ice. I started to use routinely uh, uh, some steroids to help with the inflammation, and I noticed that uh, most patients are very happy afterwards. I, uh, I actually started to make it routine in my practice. Um, it works really very well, and I I almost never hear any more of patients complaining of the swelling and the discomfort as it used to be in the past. You know, we're talking about the best way for a doctor or for a patient to locate a doctor. Um, how sh 
what are some key questions, you know, maybe three or four questions a patient could ask a doctor when asking about thyroid ablation to know that this is the right doctor for them? Well, they, they specifically need to ask about uh, the number of procedures that the doctor performed. They also should ask about their specific condition, uh, how many he performed from that specific condition, because things can be different. For example, if you have a tumor close to the nerve, is he comfortable doing with this, uh, dealing with this, and uh, what techniques that he use, hydrodissection, etc. But again, honestly, I think what's really more important is to hear what uh, patients say about their experience because that, that would at the end really matters because anyone can say whatever they want, I guess, but uh, you can trust patient experience. No, not all, not all doctors are on board with thyroid ablation. Why do you think some doctors are skeptical of thyroid ablation? I have a full lecture on this. I don't know how to put this in one minute as you request me. But if you talk the history of medicine, uh, doctors are always against the idea of new things. It takes a while for doctors to believe in a new idea. And for surgeons, they have a significant big ego. And for them to to try to move from surgery for ablation is not easy. But what really matters is the patient. It's not how you feel uh, as a doctor. So historically, it's very hard to adopt a novel intervention. And this is what we're dealing with with the RFA at this point. But eventually, it will be the standard of care. Yeah, so pretend you're at a table having dinner with four other surgeons, and they're all skeptical of thyroid ablation. What would you tell them to convince them that this is the future? Well, I tell them, you, you know, first of all, um, you are offering a good service to the patient. You're making a significant impact in, in their life. Um, second, the whole idea is to do no harms. So there is definitely lower risk of doing the ablation compared to surgery. Third, I will say, listen, this eventually will be the standard of care. And if you're not doing it now, you're going to be out of business at some point. Uh, so first, you need to care about the patient. But also, I think you need to care about yourself because eventually uh, you'll be out of business. And you said it, you know, you should care about the patient. And I feel like any surgeon, anyone treating thyroid nodules who's not offering ablation, you also said cause no harm. They're, in fact, causing harm if they're not offering this, I feel. Um, and I say that as a thyroidectomy patient. I mean, as I mentioned, patient, those listening, that they should actually, if, if they go to a surgeon that's not offering, offering ablation, that's probably a surgeon not to go to. Uh, yeah, I guess, but unless, for example, you're not a candidate for ablation. The problem that I'm, I'm seeing, though, more frequent now that a surgeon will tell patient that you are not a candidate for ablation just because. I don't know why they said that, but they said that so they can do the surgery. This is, happens again when I used to do uh, with robotic surgery. A lot of patients were told by the doctors that they are not candidates when they are very good candidates. So same thing happening with the radiofrequency ablation. So patients just need to ask for second opinion, third opinion, and know their options, etc., and take it from there. Even for the ablation, doctors who offer ablation, it can be a complicated case. And um, the person who perform ablation will say are not candid, but he's not experienced enough. And I respect that. I respect that they are, are not going to just try to put the patient at risk because the tumor is close to the nerve, for example. Um, but with experience, you can do significant work and make sure you do this safely. There are techniques to make any procedure safe. Uh, but to tell the patient that you are not a candidate, uh, I think the the surgeon or the provider is not a candidate to perform the, the procedure, but does not mean that the patient is a candidate to perform the procedure. Now, this is an interesting point. Uh, you said, in fact, it's true. A surgeon might be offering ablation, but then tell the patient you're not a candidate for ablation. In fact, they are, though. So question for you. Have you had it where a patient was told, they need a thyroidectomy, and then they come to you for a second opinion, and you say, no, no, you don't need thyroidectomy. Oh, it happens a lot. It happens uh, a lot. 
Uh, we do active surveillance for thyroid cancer, but also, unfortunately, um, this is what the data shows. <laughs> the number one, number one reason for uh, medical litigation and for doctors, surgeons to be sued in thyroid cancer for a thyroid surgery is the lack of indication. Uh, you can defend any physician with if they have any complication during surgery, as long as there was an indication. But you know, the number one reason for uh, the winning the lawsuit is that there was no indication to the operation, period. What does that mean, no indication? So patients, for example, will have a nodule that uh, benign and the uh, surgeon just somehow decided to scare the patient about the risk of cancer and decide to remove it. Uh, or a patient had a non-diagnostic biopsy and instead of repeating the biopsy, they decide to remove it. I've seen many scenarios where somehow a surgeon is able to convince or telling a patient that we need to take it out, we don't need to do a biopsy because it doesn't matter, it's suspicious, and they end up taking the whole gland even. So it's... Um, it's, 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 a, it's a fact. This is what the data shows, that uh, there's a lot of, um, um, unfortunately, um, operations performed for unclear indication. I don't know if this number is accurate, but in a previous guest recently on the podcast, the number was cited that 90,000 thyroidectomies performed in the United States each year for benign thyroid nodules. Yeah, I, uh, I I know that the number, I don't know the exact number for benign, but I know that uh, there is definitely over 100,000 uh, cases done a year in U.S. thyroid surgery. I can literally look at the exact number of the percentage of the lawsuits if you give me a minute. I have this and I can find it. But... Um, uh, Anyway, it's, a, it's just the number one. It's a high percentage. It might take me a while to find it, but uh, I don't want to just come up with the number here. I don't recall the exact number, but it's just fascinating how uh, uh, how common to have uh, surgery for no indication. Mm, something for patients to be aware of. Uh, too often, a patient uh, has blind faith. Uh, that their best interests are being performed, but it's not always the case. Yeah, I mean, you just need to trust your uh, surgeon. You just need to find the right surgeon and feel comfortable and trust uh, the plan and feel comfortable that uh, uh, the surgeon has experience doing your operation or you're doing your RFA, and uh, you should be able to have eventually excellent outcome. Dr. Kendil, ATA guidelines. Has there been a time patient comes in and ATI, ATA guidelines say you should treat this way, but you know because of innovation and technology that there's a better treatment and it should be, for, be performed a different way. Sometimes are ATA guidelines lagging behind technology? Well, it's usually the case. So the the last ATA uh, guidelines uh, were published in 2015. We we are recording this now a few days from uh, 2024. So that's almost uh, 10 years ago, a decade ago. So, and if you look at the history, it's just, I can sit here again and give you many, many examples where the guidelines keep changing significantly on all aspects, uh, on how we treat patients. Uh, for example, it used to be if you have very small, tiny, micro papillary cancer, PTC, these patients should have radioiodine therapy, and we don't do this anymore. It's like clinically insignificant, um, but these were guidelines. Um, routinely, we used to recommend, it used to be recommended to do a central lymph node dissection for every small thyroid cancer with thyroidectomy. It's not anymore. We can perform just a lobectomy for cancer up to four centimeter, as long as not uh, metastatic or aggressive. So the guidelines keep changing according to the published data. And I've been part of many of these uh, published guidelines as an author, and there's um, uh, a lot of work put in, in this uh, for sure. But um, it takes a while to uh, to 
to get something novel into the guidelines and it does take even longer time for physician to to practice according to the guidelines so there are actually published data on this it might take a decade for physician to try to adapt the practice after the guidelines what is a thyroid ablation case that you are most proud of well i i feel every patient is um, a special patient and we should provide personalized care but definitely i am proud of cases where other physicians um, decided that this is not a candidate for RFA or offer a patient RFA and did not work. And I always try to think outside the box. So, uh, for example, if a patient had an RFA and, it, and the tumor recur or the, the, the mass recur, I can repeat it and now we offer an embolization in addition to the ablation. So we have it controlled. So patient now can see the tremendous difference between their current experience and their prior experience. Um, most of my patients that uh, I see are actually already talked to many other physicians and uh, and somehow they find, find me online and know that I can take care of tough cases and I'm honored to take care of them. And many patients though are not candid still or they do not need it and I I don't need to play this game. Uh, we uh, we are very busy, and we I, I care about what I do, and I I um, I value what I offer, and uh, um, I uh, it just uh, it's just a great time to uh, enjoy what I do. It's just a fun uh, life, yeah. So let's say has there been a case where a patient comes in, they have a malignant thyroid nodule. But you say, listen, we don't need to do surgery for this. But has there been a case where the patient still is determined and says, I want the cancer out of me, do the surgery? Some patients do that, and I would respect that, and I would do it. Uh, I don't try to push patient for either way. I think, listen, we are different. I tell the patient, whatever decision you make is the right decision. But you need to counsel them about the, the pros and cons of each one. Uh, for some patient, they cannot sleep unless that thing is out of them. That's fine. If that's the case, then you should do it. Some people mm -hmm. are afraid from intervention in their body. They care about the quality of their life. They think a lot more about what's next. So you need to identify the uh, where the patient lies, the pros and cons, and then help them to make a decision. What I don't, yeah, what I don't like to do is patient ask me, what would you do? No, I don't, I'm don't. i gonna tell you what I'm going to do. I'm gonna tell you all the details that you need so you can make your decision because we are not the same. How does a person's life change when they lose their thyroid? So some patients can do very well if they um, take in the thyroid medications and they are um, having a normal thyroid function. But as I said, um, maybe one out of five will never feel normal again after that, even if they have normal thyroid function test. Because, you know, significant research out there and meetings and conferences, and we don't have some agreement about how much do you replace and what dose and... Do you do only T3, a T4 only, or T3 and T4? Do you do the synthetic, the the natural, the armor thyroid? There is significant controversy between the American thyroid association guidelines, the European guidelines. So um, it's an issue which tells you it's not an easy problem. It's a significant problem that we are dealing with. Very dynamic. Um, well, with that being said, um, where do you see the thyroid treatment going in the next 10 years for thyroid nodules or for thyroid cancer? Uh, I think it will be, uh, we will be offering um, significantly less number of operations. Um, we are still going to be, <laughs> for the surgeons out there, you're still going to be busy because you continue to help uh, these patients. Um, um, but I think with the technology, is the technology I believe will get uh, more advanced to the point that we're gonna maybe make the risk of complications um, 
like literally zero percent uh, with just uh, details and the AI and all this um, to help um, uh, making this procedure very meticulous and very precise. Doctor patient communication. What is important about the doctor and how thyroid cancer is communicated to the patient? Uh, first of all, you need to build this trust. Uh, patients should really trust in their doctor. And uh, uh, talking, about, I think uh, studies showed that one of the most important things that the patient value is um, if the doctor listen to them. And I think that's very important when we make a decision, with any decision in the treatment, uh, what kind of surgery, if surgery or radiofrequency, radioiodine, et cetera. Um, but that's the most important thing. For RFA, we provided like a, a line, specific line for RFA where we can answer questions or respond to people immediately if they have any issues or any concerns. Because sometimes all that they need is just somebody to comfort them and tell them to be okay. And we do not need to worry about this. And this is normal. Mm, Dr. Candil, this has been great. Uh, any final thoughts before we say farewell? Well, Philip, I think you are uh, doing a great job uh, helping patients with uh, thyroid problems to avoid unnecessary intervention. Um, I, uh, I think very soon we will see that uh, we are helping more patients and we are having significant less complications. And, you know, it costs a lot more when you have complications. Uh, and I think with by offering this eventually we will have a significant impact in the field and uh, just fascinating time to live uh, and to to be part of it well dr candil thank you for saving so many patients from unnecessary thyroid surgeries uh you've helped a lot of people thank you thanks philip we need to hang out at some point man we need to do stuff and yeah, uh for sure soon yeah, We're going to yeah. go out. I'm going to go get one of your workouts in if I can keep up with you. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> All right. I don't know if I'm going to press 400 pounds, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Thanks. Have, Have a great good. day.